God is good to us. I hope that you had a good week this week. I had one of those weeks that just kind of was odd, I guess. Uh, I like to try to plan my day and plan my week. Anybody like to do that? Um, I tried to do that this last week, and the Lord had other plans, you know, because that's the way it works sometimes. But it gave me an opportunity to visit with some people that I don't normally get to visit with during the week, so it was good. And, uh, and I praise the Lord for his goodness to us. I was thinking about this scripture reading this morning, um, and it's an interesting thing. And I hope you brought a Bible this morning. If you don't, there's one on the, on the hymnal rack in front of you there. Um, when Dr. Rode was reading that from the screen there, I just thought, man, that's an odd scripture reading. Anybody think that was an odd scripture reading? Or am I the only one? Amen. Are you guys awake? Yeah. yeah okay, good. Yeah, we're going to look at that story today, um, and, and maybe it'll make more sense to you. But I just want you to know today that God loves you. Did you know Amen. that? Yeah, he does. Uh, right where you are, uh, in the midst of whatever you're going through, God loves you. I was thinking about Jamie this week, and um, e even thinking about her today as we were praying for her. And um, she's dealing with stuff that nobody should ever have to deal with, mm -hmm. let alone a 17, 18-year-old girl. And so keep her in your prayers and her, her parents as well. Um, not an easy thing to confront what she's confronting, but God is still good. God still has our best interest in mind, even when we can't see it, even when it doesn't make sense. God still loves us. Amen. Uh, let's pray together. We'll jump into scripture this morning. Father in heaven, we pause and we thank you just for your sustaining grace, for your persistent, steadfast pursuit of us. And Father, often we don't pursue you with near the intensity that you have pursued us, but we, we pause right now, Father, and I'll let you catch up. And so, Father, meet us this morning. Teach us this morning. Give us some fresh manna today as we open up Scripture together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This story today, it's a, it mentions King Rehoboam, and he's actually only one of three relevant kings to this story today. But we need to back up today. So if, if you have your Bible there, you want to open to 1 Kings chapter 3. That's where we're going to jump in this morning. Because there was a time when the son of David... King Solomon, you might remember his name being mentioned at some point. If you haven't read through the book of Kings, 1 Kings at some point, you should do that. Uh, the stories in there are, are, are quite startling. We're going to look at a couple of them today. But what's interesting is that King Solomon was ruling the children of Israel, and, and things were going quite well, honestly. It was still a united empire. Israel and Judah hadn't split yet, and, and God was doing stuff in Solomon's life that are, that are really, quite honestly, pretty startling. And the reason that, that Solomon was such an amazing king and the reason that the Lord was actually doing some amazing things is because of the way Solomon started. He started well. And, you know, they tell me if you're going to finish well, you need to start well. And he started well. And you can look at his life and you can see at the end he didn't end well. And there's a reason for that. We're going to look at it today because I think it might make sense to where we are today. But in 1 Kings chapter 3, it's in verse 5, we find this, and I've got a new King James Version. It says, it says, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God says, ask, what shall I give you? Now, now I don't know if you've ever considered that, if you've ever considered the ask that God is asking his man Solomon. I wonder if you can imagine God asking you, what do you want? What do you want? Now, it's one thing when a parent asks the child what they want for their birthday, or when Christmas is approaching, what do you want? Because children learn very early, based on their surroundings, based on their culture, based on their parents' income level and prosperity and all that, they learn that there's limits to the ask. You understand that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you were raised in Beverly Hills and you have parents whose income is larger than the gross domestic product of some countries, then when you're asked, the sky is the limit. But when you're raised in a humble home with a single parent who's struggling to make ends meet, then you recognize the ask needs to be a whole lot less. But what would it be like if the Lord of all things 
the, the creator of all things, says, what should I give you? What do you want? What do you want? It's an amazing thing because, because Solomon gives an amazing answer. God, the one who has unlimited resources, the one who actually could give him anything that he asks for. Anything. Solomon gives a good ask. He, instead of asking for selfish gain for himself alone, he asks, it's in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. We're going to read a few verses. It's okay if we read Bible in church. Amen. Amen. Look what he says. Give to your servant an understanding heart to judge more people. They're not my people, they're your people. And he, and he calls himself a servant even though he's a king. It's a good clue into his character. Amen? Amen. Give to your servant. I want to be your servant. I want to rule your people. And I need an understanding heart that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? And the speech, verse 10 says, please the Lord. That Solomon had asked this thing. He could have asked anything for himself. And, and the Lord God says to him, he says, because you have asked this thing and not asked, not asked long life for yourself, you haven't asked for riches for yourself, you haven't asked for the life of your enemies, but you've asked for yourself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, check this out. I have done according to your word. See, I, I've given you a wise and understanding heart. So there's not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any arise after you. And I've also given you what you have not asked. Riches, honor, so that there will be not anyone like you among the kings in all your days. So if you walk in my ways, if you, if you keep my statutes, my commandments, as your father David walked, then I'm going to lengthen your days. It's an amazing thing that God does. You see what's going on is Solomon humbles himself before his God. Amen. And because he humbles himself, God lifts him up. Amen. God causes him to be great. It's an amazing thing. As Solomon walks in the ways of the Lord, the Lord does exactly what he says he's going to do. He makes him wise. He makes him prosperous. He makes him generous. Uh, one of the first things Solomon does is he begins to construct the temple that David wanted to build. You remember? Yeah. And what a temple he builds. Yeah. An amazing thing that Solomon could, You can read about it there in 1 Kings. And uh, like I said, if you've never read 1 Kings, it's one of those books that doesn't get a lot of press in some people's lives. You've got to read that book sometime. It, it's an amazing thing. The, the most holy place. It's 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet. He lines the whole thing in cedar, and then he covers it all in gold. It's an amazing thing, this gold. He, he actually becomes the golden king. It takes seven years to complete the temple. Seven years. And, and by all accounts, it was something amazing to behold. And the Lord speaks to Solomon several times in the narrative. And every time he's, he speaks to him, he says, You just continue to walk in my ways. You continue to keep my statutes, and I'm going to keep the blessings coming. It's an amazing thing. He says, I'm, I'm going to keep pouring it out on you. And Solomon's fame spreads because God is making him wise. Because God is blessing his life, other people want to know what he knows. The Queen of Sheba comes to pay him a visit. You need to read that story. The, the amount of gold that exchanges hands between the two of them. That is blessing each other. She's amazed at what he knows. He knows things about botany. He knows things about biology. He knows... The Lord has given him all kinds of knowledge and insight. Amen. The Lord is lifting him up. It's an amazing thing to see Solomon at his peak. And, and what I've discovered is this. Solomon reaches his pinnacle of fame and wealth and fortune when he is as humble as he's ever been. You see, the degree to which he humbles himself, the degree to which he wants to please his God and minister to God's people, is the degree to which God exalts him and lifts him up and blesses him in every single way. The lower he gets, the higher God lifts him up. Amen. And he's at his peak. You, you can look at his wisdom and his wealth. Look at 1 Kings chapter 10. I want to share this with you so, so that you get the idea that when I say God was blessing him, I want you to understand what I mean by that. 
1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14. You need to read this because it's an amazing thing. I love the sound of pages turning. <laughs> and church, amazing thing too. But look what it says. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14. The weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly. Uh, this wasn't a one-time gift, okay? This is yearly, annual income. Just the gold was 666 talents of gold, besides all that, that came from traveling merchants, from the income of traders, from all the kings of Arabia, from the governors of the country. This is the stuff, uh, this is just the weight of the gold that came in. 600, now a talent of gold is 75 pounds. 75 pounds, I did the math. You wanna know the math? People always wanna know the math. Yeah, that's good. And some of you may be figuring the math already. Some of you can do that in your heads. 666 talents of gold at 75 pounds each. 49,950 pounds of gold coming in a year. Did you know what the price of gold is today? I, I checked the market Friday at 1 o'clock. It, it changes a little bit. It was on its way up. I don't know where it closed. But Friday at 1 o'clock, gold in the United States is $1,260 an ounce. 12, 16 ounces. 16 ounces in a pound. You want to know the math? Yeah. Of course you do. Yeah. I did too. That's why I did this. One pound of gold today, in U.S. dollars today, $20,160 for one pound of gold. Now Solomon, coming into his kingdom yearly, 49,950 pounds of gold. Think about it. You want to know what it was worth? In today's dollars, I was going to tell you it's, it's worth just a little over one billion dollars, but it's more than just a little over a billion dollars. It's a billion, 7.8 million. So it's just 7.8 million over a billion a year. Do you see what I mean how God was blessing him? God is pouring it out on him. You see? Because he's lowered himself, because he just wants to be a servant. He, he didn't ask to be rich. He didn't ask to be, he, he didn't ask for that stuff. Just make me a wise servant. Just teach me how to teach me how to govern your people. And God says, hang on, buddy. Fix it pour it out on you. And he keeps pouring it out. And at his peak, he, he does something that's quite amazing. Something that that we're going to talk about today because it doesn't make any sense. The verses for our scripture, they don't make any sense unless you understand this. At his peak, verse 16, 1 Kings chapter 10, King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 shekels of gold went into each shield. That's pounds and pounds. But these aren't like. He also made 300 shields of hammered gold. Three minas of gold went into each shield. And he put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. It was a house dedicated to God. It was an impressive building on its, in its own right. You should read about it in 1 Kings sometime. But what, what Solomon does is something that's pretty, pretty amazing. He, he makes shields of pure gold. And some people say, well, this seems like a waste of gold. He just hangs them up in a the house. Uh, they're, just, they're just on display. 500 shields of gold. Just on display. They're not made for warfare. You understand that, right? Because gold is not a good shield. Gold is a soft metal, you see? And gold is heavy. The weight of these shields, these soldiers would struggle to carry. It wouldn't be anything that's going to help them in battle. And Solomon knew that, you see? Solomon didn't build these shields to be carried into battle. He built them for a different reason. Solomon's father was David. Did you remember that? And his father was his father was David, and, and David enjoyed singing. And David wrote a lot of psalms. And if you have your Bible, turn with me to Psalm chapter twenty-eight, because there's a psalm here written by his father that likely he heard sung, and probably he sang. And it's something that we need to pay attention to because because this psalm is pretty amazing. I, I was just going to read one verse, but I think we're going to read this psalm because you, you need to get the idea of what this verse is really about. Psalm chapter twenty-eight. Psalm 28, a psalm of David. To you I will cry, O Lord, my rock. Do not be silent to me. 
lest if you are silent to me, I become like those who go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you. When I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary, don't take me away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity who speak peace to their neighbors, but evil is in their hearts. Give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them according to the work of their hands. Render to them what they deserve because they do not regard the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands. He shall destroy them and not build them up. Blessed be the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices. And with my song, I will praise him. Solomon has these shields constructed of pure gold. And he hangs them up in this house dedicated to the Lord because he knows who his shield is. Amen. He's not trusting in the shield of man. He's not trusting in the strength of some warrior's arm. Or in the integrity of his shield. No, he knows who his shield is. And he puts it on display 500 times for everybody to see. The Lord is my shield. The Lord is protecting his people. I don't have to worry about armies. I don't have to worry about the strength and, and skill of a, of, a, of a disciplined warrior. No, I've got God on my side. Amen. You see? He's established that fact. He's, he's demonstrated that fact, knowing that God is his shield. Not doubting, not questioning. He knows God is his shield, and he puts his full trust in it. Amen. The strength of the Lord protects Israel. It's not too long after that that Solomon gets distracted, unfortunately. <coughs> if you read 1 Kings chapter 11, the very first, very first verse of that chapter, in my Bible it says, it starts out with the word but. But, you know the rest of that sentence? But, but King Solomon loved many foreign women. And they become his Achilles heel. He, he marries foreign women who worship different gods. They, they worship gods who aren't really gods at all. And we know there are no gods at all, but, but he lets his affection for those women. He lets his affection for those women replace his allegiance to God, and he begins to do what he vowed he would never do. He begins to worship those pagan gods. He sets up temple. At first, it's, it's innocent, okay? He, he marries a foreign wife. She doesn't believe like he believes, so he just says, well, let's just build you a temple off out there. You can worship your pagan. I still love you. I, I want to minister to you. I want to take care of you. You're my wife, after all. And, and so I want to please you. There's nothing wrong with pleasing your wife, husbands. Amen? Amen. But you should know that one wife is all you need. Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. He's wanting to please his wife. And he sets up a temple, and then he marries another one who worships a different one, and so he sets up another temple. And, and pretty soon there's temples all over the place. And because he has a desire to be pleasing to his wife, he begins to worship in those temples. Young people, be careful. Marrying someone who doesn't believe like you believe can and often does cause you to do things that you have taken a vow that you would never do. Amen. Now, I know some people will say, well, Pastor, I know so-and-so. And, and they married an non-advocate. And, and, and because they were faithful to pray and, and all that, their, their spouse eventually became a Seventh-day Adventist. And I say, praise the Lord for that. Amen. But I can tell you that I have seen, that I have counseled many couples where it didn't go that way. Where the Adventist ends up forsaking their Adventism. Where they end up not going to any church in an effort to be pleasing to their spouse. In an effort to try to Keep peace at home, you see. When you're not worshiping the same God in the same way on the same day, life can be miserable. Ask my wife. She can tell you. Until you or your spouse are convinced to worship and, and do things differently. The reality is, one of you will change. Amen. Now, I know that there's some who would argue
argue with me and say, well, my faith is strong enough. Solomon thought his was too. It is. It is. Uh, Solomon, Solomon ends up losing his kingdom. And not because some warring tribe came in and took it from him. It wasn't because he was lacking military might. It wasn't because that he had an economic collapse. That's not what happened either. Solomon loses his kingdom because he loses his focus. Amen. Because instead of giving honor and fealty to God, he begins to give honor and fealty to people. He changes things. Worship of God no longer was a priority. And sadly, after his death, the kingdom is divided. We don't have time to get into all the specifics about what caused the division of scripture. In, in scripture, you can read it. We don't have time today, but, but I want you to realize today that as our Scripture reading was read, there's a context. Solomon has died, his kingdom is divided. Jeroboam gets the ten northern tribes. They've got a greater military, they've got they've got greater amount of people. It, it's really the greater of the two nations, in some senses. They establish their capital at Bethel. Rehoboam gets two southern tribes, and his nation is called Judah. And the one thing he possesses that makes his kingdom greater is Jerusalem. The temple is there. You see? And, and if the temple is there, they thought God is there. The temple is there. But Rehoboam, he's not a man after God's own heart, like David was. He's not pursuing humility as Solomon once did. He demands much more taxation from the people. He, he makes their yoke heavy, and they don't like it. But the temple is there. Do you know the temple can be there and God cannot be in the temple? We find out why God is displeased. It's in 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 22. We're almost to our text for the day. Hang in there. Look what he says, verse 22 and following. Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. That's this nation. They did what was evil. They, they provoked him to jealousy with their sins that they committed. More than all their fathers had done. Well, they also built for themselves high places and pillars and Asherim. Those are groves of trees. We call them totem poles today because that's what they did. They, they made these things. And, 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 and it was for the purpose of idol worship. They made them on every high hill, he says, and under every green tree. And there were also male cult prostitutes in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations that the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And it brings us to our text today. Verse 25. It happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. And he also took away all of those gold shields. Solomon. You see, the symbols of God's protection, the symbols of God's divine help, the symbols of his watch care over his people are removed. And because Rehoboam is not seeking God to protect his nation, he's not seeking God for wisdom, he is not humble. But on the contrary, he's very stiff necked and hard heart. I'm glad we're not like that. What he does next testifies to the kind of man he is, testifies to the kind of king he is. And, and if you read quickly, you'll miss it. I want you to see what he does next, because, because my Bible says this. It says, King Rehoboam made in their place, in, in place of the gold shields, he, he, he places, he, he makes shields of bronze. And he committed them to the hands of the officers of the guards who, who kept the door of the king's house. And it was often that the king went into the house of the Lord. The guard carried them and brought them back into the guard room. You see what he does? He doesn't make shields of gold. 
He makes shields that are gold-ish. They're gold-ish. He doesn't put them in the house of the Lord. He puts them in the hands of men. And they're not there to protect the nation. They're there to protect numero uno, the king. <clears throat> Do you see what happens when we begin to place our trust in men Amen. rather than putting our trust in God? Mm. He replaces those shields of gold with shields of bronze. And sure, they look like gold, sort of. They're gold-ish. And when the sun catches them just right, they look okay. And instead of hanging them in the house, he puts them in the hands of men. Did you know that when JFK was shot, some of you remember that. When JFK was shot, the Secret Service Agency had a total of 350 agents. 29 of them were present in Dallas at the time. They had intel before the shooting that somebody was going to be shooting at JFK. Did you know that? Their annual budget for the Secret Service back then was five and a half million dollars a year. They had one job, protect the president. When Ronald Reagan was shot, some of you remember that too. I asked some kids today if they knew Ronald Reagan was shot, they had no idea. <laughs> Who's Ronald Reagan? <laughs> that was 1981, if you want to feel old for a minute. <laughs> it's been that long. But when Ronald Reagan was shot, the Secret Service agency had 1,500 agents. 1,500. And they brought the scope. They were to protect the president and his family, um, international delegates coming in, uh, presidents that were no longer president. And, and so they, they needed more. There are now today, you want to know, don't you? 3,500 Secret Service agents. With an annual budget that has grown in an exponential way that I, I don't even want to get into today. The annual budget for the Secret Service is $1.7 billion. $1.7 billion. Listen, saints, you need to know this. There, there's no one who can protect you like God can protect you. Amen. There's no one who can provide for you like God can Amen. provide for you. There's no one like our God. Amen. And while you've been embraced that golden truth, and at some point in your life, maybe you have, and you, you sit here and you say, amen, God is my God. I'm fearful that some may have, in an unaware kind of way, exchanged that golden faith that they once had for a shield of bronze. That you placed that faith that you had so firmly in God. And if you were hard pressed, you'd discover that your faith really isn't in God. Now, bronze shields look good when they're shined up. But when you put some effort into polishing those things, I remember I was in the ROTC in high school and we had brass and we had to shine that stuff. And when you shine that stuff, it shines Amen. like gold. It's goldish. <laughs> and sometimes we put a lot of effort into polishing up the bronze. So that it appears to men as if we are them. I want you to know something. If your faith today is not gold but gold-ish, you need to pay attention. Because gold-ish won't get you into the kingdom. You know where you are today. See, that's the reality is that you can fool a lot of people with a bronze shield. You can. People who don't know you take a casual look at you and they say, oh, they're gold. They're gold. And even people that do know you, if you work hard enough with that polish, you can convince them that you're gold as well. But you know. You know. Amen. And bronze shields won't get it. If the heat was cranked up, if your faith was placed in the crucible and melted down, you know you'd be found out. Would it be discovered that your faith was really in God? Or have you put it somewhere else? I propose today there are at least three warning signs, things that you need to be watchful for. 
lest you exchange your shield of gold for a shield of bronze. Your, your faith will become goldish rather than gold. And, and warning sign number one is that you begin to think that your life is shaping up pretty nicely. And, and it's all because of your own hard work and dedication and wisdom. Why is that an issue, some might say? Well, it's because you began to praise yourself instead of praising God. You see, you, you began to exchange adoration that belongs to God, and you redirect that adoration to yourself. In effect, you're making yourself a God. And you begin to worship self. And I know it sounds extreme. Some of you say, Pastor, that's a little extreme. And it sounds extreme. But it happens slowly. And you say, well, I'm not worshiping myself. I'm here at church. I just put a check in the offering plate. Everything's, I'm still worshiping God. You see, the real danger is the subtlety in which self-exaltation happens. In little thoughts. And in little ways. The enemy is clever. Have you figured that out yet? We begin to think that we've achieved what we have. Not because of God's protection or because God's care or because God wants to bless our lives. Not, not because of that but because of our own cleverness, because of our own discernment, because of decisions we made, because of things we did. And the golden shields of faith begin to come off the wall. And they're being replaced by these bronze shields of work. Danger number two. We begin to please people rather than pleasing God. I believe Solomon loved his wives. I think he probably loved all of them in a certain way. And it was this love for them and his desire to please them that causes him to do things that he would never have done. Now, you need to have a desire to please your spouse. You need that. But his desire to please the ones he loved was greater than his desire to please his God. And it happens all the time. I've had people tell me they feel convicted about doing something. They feel convicted about something. Their spouse does not feel convicted about the same thing. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there today. The conviction is biblical. And I'm persuaded that if they were to do it together, the Lord would bless them. No doubt about it. If they were courageous enough to do it. They feel convicted. Their spouse doesn't. And because... They want to please their spouse. Neither one of them do. And they remain in this lukewarm spiritual existence. Because they don't want to displease their spouse. They don't do what God has convicted them they should do. And it happens in reverse sometimes. Sometimes people are convicted of things they should stop doing. And because their spouse hasn't been convicted of that yet, and they don't want to rock the boat, they want to maintain peace, they just keep on doing it. Even though the Lord has convicted them, they should stop. Pleasing people rather than pleasing God can cause those shields of gold to be removed from your wall of faith because you're placing your faith in the hands of people. Because you're trusting in the wisdom of people instead of the mighty God. Danger number three. We, we began to think that we can take better care of us than God can. And it happens slowly and it can take many shapes. But we began to withhold things that belong to God. That God has said belong to him. We, we begin to withhold things. What are you talking about, Pastor? Well, we begin to withhold our worship. We, we begin to withhold our praise. We begin to withhold our time, and in many cases, we begin to withhold our money. And we begin to redirect those things away from God. And you're in danger, friends, of your gold shield being exchanged for one of bronze because slowly you begin to steal from God things that belong to Him. What does that look like, Pastor? Well, I believe that God is worthy of our worship. Amen. Thank you, Larry. I was hoping everybody would say that. I believe that God is worthy of our worship. Amen. He's the only one Amen. that is worthy of our worship. Because he is the only creator. Amen. 
because he is the sustainer, because he is the provider, because he is the giver of all good gifts, because he is our redeemer, if nothing else, amen? amen? He is the only one worthy of our worship. There's none like him. And no other person or thing is worthy of your worship or your praise. Nobody is. But when we begin to worship someone else or something else, and we begin to praise that thing or that person, you are stealing from God praise and worship that belong to him. Amen. How do we do that? Well, we get to be more focused on that person or that thing. Uh, whether it's a video game, whether it's an addiction, wh whatever it is, we begin to focus more on that thing or that person. And we begin to spend more and more time with that thing or that person, and you know what happens when you do that? The demands go up. And they demand more time, and more worship, and more money. And you begin to give things to that person or that thing, praise and worship and adoration and money. You begin to redirect those things that belong to God to that thing you are putting in place of God. And if you're not careful, you're going to find that that time and that money that you used to give God ends up going to what you are now worshiping. Mm -hmm. And there's a great danger that your shields, once pure gold, are being exchanged for shields that are gold-ish. But you say, oh, Pastor, I still go to church. I, I still pray on occasion. You know nobody knows you like you know. Amen. You know that you're not where you once were. Now some of you are gold today. Praise God for that. Amen. But some of you in here are bronze. That people that don't know you like you know you, they think you're gold. But they think you're gold. You look gold. Passing by, you look gold. If you're eating the right foods, you're saying the right things, you're going to church on the right day, you're gold. The question today is for you is, is are you gold? Or are you just gold-ish? I, I can tell you this morning that God wants to fill your life with gold. Not like those prosperity preachers preach. But God wants to give you a gold faith. Because it's faith in God that saves you. Amen. You put your faith in any other person and you are not gold. You're goldish. And you can spend all kinds of time and effort polishing the gold. By the way that you dress. By eating a vegan diet. You can make that, that bronze look almost gold. The Lord asked Solomon, what shall I give you? Today I ask you, what do you want? What do you want from God? I want a faith that's pure gold. Amen. That's purely in God. Not in self, not in others. Amen. I want to place my whole trust in God. Amen. My whole self. Amen. Not just some, but all. And I want to be able, at the end of it all, to say my God is it. Because I know I am under. Amen. If that's what you want today, if you're ready to exchange the bronze for gold, then I just want you to stand up with me so I can pray for you. Amen. Let's pray together. Oh, Father. It's amazing that you love us like you do. Amen. We are so inconsistent and so self-reliant and so self-serving. You have called us, Father, to trust you completely in all things. And I pray this morning, Father, that we would begin to do that. Amen. That you would take away, Father, our bronze shields that we have carried in our arms that we have tried to ward off the enemy with on our own. Mm -hmm. 
and that you would, Father, replace it with a shield of gold hanging in the Hall of Fame of Faith, that we might begin, Father, to trust you in all things, Amen. that we would look to you to be our strength because we are miserably weak, that we would look to you to be our defender, that we would look to you, Father, to bless our lives, Amen. that you would grow our faith, Father. Amen. It's small, it's weak, it's fragile. Father, we put it into your hands and ask that you would nurture it. That you would minister to your people today, Father. That you would forgive us of the times where we have fought our own battles, gone our own way, done our own thing, looking gold-ish. But, Father, you've known the whole time. And so I pray today, Father, for a surrendered heart. Amen. That you would give us what your servant Solomon wished for. A spirit of discernment. A heart that's willing to serve. And that you would, Father, reign supreme in our lives, that we would recognize our position unto you. And so, Father, humble us today. <laughs> Bless your people. Father, fill us with the Holy Spirit and with power that we might have victory, not in our own flesh and in our own way and in our own time, but that we might have victory, Father, because you give us victory. Amen. Help us. Teach us patient with us when we try to exchange shields. Be patient with us and remind us who you are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.